So, we move on to a serious look at the riddle and how we got here. Taking it back to 1830s, it appears that England was a pretty amazing place and astonished and disappointed and upset and puzzled people. But why, by 1830, was it such a strange sort of place? What had happened in the previous hundred years or so to lead to this situation? And in particular, why there? Why in the Midlands of this wet, poor, marginal community was there the first great shift from a, an agrarian world into an industrial world? And you, anyone thinking about it for a moment at the beginning of that period in 1730 would have thought, well, if it's going to happen anywhere, it's certainly not going to happen in England. There were many other places on the continent where, for instance, you might have expected it to occur. There were many bright, energetic, learned people. And so one of the puzzles is certainly why England? Why then? Why England? For instance, what about France, Simon? I mean, did they not have any ingenuity in France? Could they yes, not indeed. have thought of such a thing? Yeah, um, I mean, obviously, stories we tell about why things happen depend on what we want to explain. I mean, if what we're trying to explain is something which connects together the factory system, automation, big and powerful machinery, rapid accumulation of profits, stuff like that, go back to 1730, look at France in comparison with England. There doesn't prime uh, to any intense purpose, there seemed to be any reason why you would pick England, especially the Midlands and the northwest of England, over what was called then the great nation, France. Far higher population, very strong central administration of the state, very large and extremely well supported intellectual group of uh, philosophers, scientists, engineers in Paris and elsewhere rapidly expanding colonial control, vast international trade. It's very difficult indeed to pick out what it is that's going on in Midlands and northeast, northwest of England as, a, as, a, as opposed to what's happening in central France. Good way of getting at the puzzle is to think about um, the, the kinds of devices that were being built at this time and what they were used for. And one of my favorite examples is Vaucanson's duck. So Jean Vaucanson is a young engineer born uh, in the French Alps who was trained by men of the church in science and in religion. He left home when he was very young. He got into trouble with his teachers and with, with his family. He comes to Paris. His career in early 18th century Paris, I think, tells us a great deal about what was possible and what was not in France as opposed to England. What he does when he's in Paris is to make his name when he's in his 20s by building three automata. Automata are machines that mimic the behavior of living beings. They'd have been very familiar in market squares, on churches, in fairgrounds. What was unusual about Vaucanson's machines was their extraordinary technical skill. Um, that he, he, he designed a machine that was a drummer, one which was a flute player, and above all his famous duck, which was a machine in the shape and size of a normal duck that could apparently do the things a normal duck could do. It could flap its wings, lift and open its beak, it could defecate. It was terribly impressive. It was put on show at the big Paris fairs. It, it was shown to the king. It stayed the image of what 18th century ingenuity is all about, such an extent that, for example, there's a, a man at the moment who is, in fact, building a working, precise replica of Vaucanson's duck. So, Simon, the French had very skilled work people who could make amazing ducks and other things. The Germans had very good chemists and uh, workmen too, who could make all sorts of things. And yet, neither of them led into a machine age based on steam power and so on. That seems to be the moral of looking sideways at that Yeah, I time. think there are two interesting aspects of that. One is, certainly in the story of Automata, and I think in the story of Porcelain too, you, you have radical in innovations of great skill and complexity which come through traditional societies, through court society, through 
relatively traditional mm. forms of patronage of princes of the wealthy mm. sponsoring, su su supporting creative ind individuals, precisely protecting them from mm. certain kinds of pressure, often against their will. <laughs> um, on the other hand, what you don't have is, and I think this comes out wonderfully well in the porcelain story too, is then the transition from adoption to use. And we mm. spend a lot of time thinking about innovation and noticing when new stuff happens. And we perhaps don't spend enough time thinking about use, about what is common in the everyday world of people and how much that matters, not only to how people live, but what the next generation of entrepreneurs is going to think it's worth investing in and it's worth developing. And I think certainly the story of Porcelain and Wedgwood mm. and Creamware is a marvelous e example of that. Think about what people are using at least as much as you think about where the new stuff is coming from. Mm. Yeah. Well, the third case, I mean, coming back to England and um, Britain, I had the chance to go to Coalbrookdale, which is often thought to be the epicenter of the Industrial Revolution in Britain, the place where Abraham Darby found a new smelting process. And I'd never been there, and I was uh, struck by all sorts of things. Firstly, this point you're making, you're both making, which is that the social structure within which innovations occur mm. is absolutely essential. Mm. The, the great difference seems to be yeah. most continental countries have very stratified um, systems whereby most of these innovations occur at the top and most of the work remains there, it doesn't spread out sideways. But in the Midlands at that time and in the north of England, you had societies with growing middling sort of people who had a certain amount of money and interest in buying Wedgwood's pottery and so on. It was sold there and it was sold to London. So you have a different social structure within which the innovation is occurring, which is, encourages their activity. The other, that doesn't really particularly come out in Kilbrookdale, but that's an important element. What did strike me was this, this narrow gorge in which you have the clay for the pottery. Mm. They dig a hole in the ground, and all these magical things come out of it. They, first of all, it'd be all this clay, so you can make all your Wedgwood mm. pots or anything else you like. Then iron ore, so you can start using iron in a really sensible and powerful way, lots of iron ore. But then how are you going to use that iron? How are you going to heat it and smelt it? And there is all the coal there as well. So, and you've also got water, a stream running down, so you can build up and use water power. So you've got four things all together, plus a population that is hard working, and plus a society where the uh, bonds of, of people, for example, Quaker, influences which attracted Abraham Darby to that area, his Quaker relations. All that comes together in one particular valley with one particular point and starts this extraordinary process. Well, it doesn't start it, but it certainly emphasizes it. So actually being there and walking around, you could see this. So um, Colebrookdale, is one thing is happening. In the two instances you've given, something else is happening. But to return to the factories and Vaucanson's factory. Um, I mean, why didn't it mass produce useful things? Well, um, again, there's certainly no lack of will, and especially there's no lack of will at the top. When Vaucanson's um, made quite a pile of money as showman, entrepreneur, technician, He's then um, hired by the French government, we're now in the 1740s and early 1750s, to do to the French silk trade what the Europeans had been trying to do to the China porcelain trade. That is to say, to find a way of making in France silk of the quality and quantity that was pouring in, in this case from northern Italy, where, where there were very sophisticated silk mills. So Vaucanson, as engineer, is given the job by the French government of designing and then setting up a completely new kind of silk mill based on a rather dramatically automated set of machines 
to spin and weave silk. And he's given military backing, he's given finance, he's given a state monopoly. He moves to the great French city of Lyon, uh, which is the Birmingham of France, uh, the main silk-making center of France, amongst other things, and tries to set up his silk works there. There's massive protest from silk workers, from the existing silk bosses. Vaucanson has to get out of town in a hurry. He manages to escape at night, dressed as a monk. His <laughs> mill is burnt down. His, his machines are broken. State, state support is withdrawn. Towards the end of his life, 1760s, 1770s, he sets up a few silk factories down in the south of France, in the area of, Ar of Ardèche, on enlightened, rational lines, as he sees it, with machines that, that are obviously going to throw lots of people out of work and make silk in relatively large quantities. But what we don't see in later 18th century France is that extraordinary feedback between ever-expanding demand and the capacity to increase supply to meet that demand, and perhaps most importantly, the, ca the ca capacity to introduce mechanization at the bottlenecks so that it's no good having a lot of thread if, you, if then this floods and uh, dominates the capacity to weave it at sufficient speeds. That's what you see in the English system, this extraordinary feedback and you don't see that in, for example, the silk trades in France. Now, one reason for that, I don't think it's the only reason, but a really important reason is what, what, what you call the top-down model of French in, in, in industrial development. All the initiatives that, that I've just talked about are from Paris. They come from the, from the government, from the uh, Board of Trade, from the Bureau of Commerce. They are imposed on the great French pr provincial centers by the capital. And you do not see nearly so many local in, in, in initiatives which are responding to particular kinds of local demand. You don't see club land in that sense. W what you see is a rational plan absolutely sensible and in the end rather ineffective system of automation and industrial change. Well, that, that is fascinating because um, our views on this are obviously very similar because when people have asked, they've been searching for the cause of the Industrial Revolution in England for a very long time and many people have despaired of finding it and they've always said there is this X factor, this special factor now, none of us believe that the British were in any way superior in intelligence or in any other respect. Therefore, it can't be in the individuals in the system, but it's in the organization of those individuals in relationship to each other. Yeah. It's partly to do with the social structure, as we've said, but it's also this ability of people from different spheres of life to collaborate and work together. And this is a very old and strong feature of English society. It goes back into the medieval period, the medieval guilds, and then up through the concept of trust and trusts, through the setting up of all sorts of associations, religious associations, nonconformist sects, for instance, um, economic things such as the uh, insurance companies, the Bank of England, Lloyd's Insurance, all these started as trusts and as groups of people. Likewise, um, social clubs, political clubs, all sorts of clubs where people pool their efforts as we are trying to do here, um, bringing whatever talents they have, sharing their expertise from different spheres of life. And the particularly odd thing was that you got uh, industrialists, clergymen, mm -hmm. um, businessmen mm -hmm. sitting around evening after evening. Many of them met, met uh, the Lunar Club and so on, met once a month, full moon. They'd sit round and they would talk about their problems and one would say, look, we've got a real problem here. I wonder how we can get this stuff to, to um, weave better. Mm -hmm. And someone across the table from an entirely different sphere of life would say, oh, well, I've got some analogy in my sphere. They'd bring them together, they'd share it, and then they'd work together. And that ability to pool, to drop hierarchy and to drop all their individual differences to focus on a common problem from all their different spheres of life 
is a very difficult thing to do. Very few civilizations have been able to do it over long periods. Um, to retain your individuality and at the same time to work in common, to forget class, regionality and background, and to set up these little pools of activity all over the country, in Scotland, in England and so on. And this seems to me to be one of the really special things about that period where, which I don't see so much, certainly. Yeah, I mean, there are, and there are lots of examples of ways in which that kind of association actually mattered to in, industrialization and the automation of production. I mean, certainly in the lowlands of Scotland from the 1730s until the 1780s, that's a society which is particularly characterized by the strength and the vigor of local political, religious, economic, scientific associations. And we also see in lowland Scotland a very r rapid rate of what contemporaries at the time called improvement <laughs> with a capital I, um, which begins to dom make Scottish enter enterprise dominate the whole of the British economy, really, in pretty rapidly. Similarly, the story of Edmund Cartwright, who's an Oxford don, and local clergyman in the Midlands. In 1784, um, Cartwright is essentially having dinner with a group of local industrialists. Their problem is just this. They can make thread very, very fast and in large quantities, but they have a block at the process of weaving. And since weaving is certainly not automated, but done on hand looms still, um, their problem is that they can supply far more thread to weavers than weavers can then process rapidly. Cartwright's heard about a machine which is on show in London in 1784, which is an automaton which can play chess and win. It's in the shape of a Turk, because all exotic things come from the East. And Cartwright's read about this in the newspaper. He may even have seen it, because it went on tour. And Cartwright says, if people are clever enough to build a machine which can play and win at chess, surely we can build a machine which can weave cloth. And this provides in... Clubs, do you think clubs are the solution to British Industrial Revolution? This seems to me a very benign view of just how this change happened in Britain. Um, first of all, the, it does seem to me that the, the picture of um, resistance and difficulty uh, with introducing new technology in France um, isn't something that was confined to France. Britain also went through this. I mean, Hargreaves, <laughs> had to f introduces his spinning jenny and immediately has to flee as well and eventually gets adopted by um, um, knitting manufacturers in Nottingham where he has to be protected in what was called a factory safe. The windows were all blocked up on the lower floors and um, he was virtually a prisoner in the, uh, made himself a, a prisoner in, in these, um, these large scale workshops which were a for an early form of factory. Um, but the clubs were, yes, I'm sure they were, um, there's a lot to be gained with all this discussions that's taking place um, across various groups and um, from people from various parts of the country as well. But you can't tell me that the people who were actually working the machines and working on the technology were a member of any of those clubs. The, the artisans, the, the people with the technical skills were not parts of, part of these groups. They were not from the educated middle classes or from the, the gentry. Um, this was a gentlemanly um, discussion that we, we see during in the sort of club society of the 18th century. Do you think there's something to be said then about the forms of sociability that link together precisely the kinds of artisans that you're talking about. I mean, if what we're trying to explain is relatively dramatic, both in terms mm. of space and time, changes of automation, of industrial production, mm. and of supply, as well as de demand, one of the things that has to be explained in the British case is the extreme rapidity 
with which subtle advantages in one side get yes. diffused throughout the economy. Yeah. And I think what's striking in comparison mm. with the French case is that the French system works by the sale and preservation of monopolies, mm. which are granted and ferociously defended by the state. I mean, the reason why Vaucanson thought it worth getting involved mm. in this harebrained mm -hmm. scheme was because he would have complete control mm. over the national silk trade. Mm -hmm. And I think what Alan's story about club land and association does point us towards is that that's not confined to a genteel, high bourgeois sector of life. On the, on the contrary, where I think Alan's approach might pay real dividends mm. for us is to make us think about the ways in which artisans themselves gather together. James Watt's career is a superb example mm -hmm. of this. I mean, after all, he starts um, as a relatively poor instrument maker, gets a job with Glasgow University mm -hmm. repairing their instrument collection, mm -hmm. and, is, and you see relatively high degrees of social mobility and of association, I think above all of communication of skills mm -hmm. across the country between precisely the crucial people that you're talking about. So yeah, if we think about, you know, polite St. James's West End club land mm. alone, we would make the mistake that yeah. you rightly point to. But if we extend that to understand a wider form of sociability amongst all artisans, I think that, that story's actually got a lot going for it, wouldn't you say? Mm -hmm. Possibly. I think we need to know um, much more about sure. how um, artisans um, related to each other, how they traveled and how these skills were um, diffused. Mm. And just, I mean, what is really interesting is just how quickly those um, networks of knowledge spread. Absolutely. That someone like Bolton or Wedgwood or whatever, they, they were um, outsourcing all of uh, so many of those processes to an amazing array of people and they knew exactly who was the guy yeah. who was the yeah. best person at um, gilding this little little piece or who could make this this uh, this precise piece of instrument and they would send their things all over the country to to be completed in this way so I think it's it's it there does seem to have been an amazing um, amazingly widespread and cosmopolitan yeah. knowledge of who who could exactly do what so and where those skills at doing one thing might be transferred to doing something else. So doesn't, doesn't that explain yes. a little bit the difference mm -hmm. between what's going on in Britain and what's going on in France mm -hmm. in the sense that the presumption in Britain is first and foremost that an innovation is supposed to make money, it's supposed to be commercialized. Mm. Yes. In France, nobody's averse to money any, in any society that mm. I know of, mm. but in France, innovations are first and foremost supposed to serve the state, mm. they are geared toward the military, and what's not useful to the military can be used to entertain, yeah. particularly mm -hmm. the upper class, there you have Simon's mm -hmm. duck again mm -hmm. and so on. Mm -hmm. In Britain, it's supposed first and foremost, to make money. Why do these people come to these clubs to talk to each other? Why do they come to lectures, to listen to itinerant lecturers like Jean mm. Desaguliers mm. or like John Smeaton to talk about pubs? <laughs> it's because they feel that somewhere something mm. could be said that would help them to make money. And uh, it, it, I think in the middle of the 18th century, a Swiss engineer who visits Britain, you know, writes down the famous sentence that for a particular invention to make money, it has to be invented in France and perfected mm. in Britain. Mm -hmm. Because in Britain, people think pragmatically. They think that new knowledge, first and foremost, is supposed to make money. In some sense, you could say that this is, uh, this is sort of the direct inheritance of a Baconian mm. tradition that mm. says, look, new knowledge isn't there just to satisfy our curiosity or to serve the state. It is there for an economic purpose to mm. serve our material needs. Mm. Now, I think it's a difference in degree, but the, the more you read about 18th century Britain, the more you feel that they are really imbued with this, you know, not just the merchant classes, but even the upper classes, even the landlords want to read about farm practices because they think this will increase their rents. And mine owners want to read about pumps. Mm 
and so on and so forth. People want mm. to do knowledge is mm. supposed to make money. That I think is a mm. key to modernity. And I think the Germans and the French are lagging a little bit in this respect, and other nations in Europe even more so. Britain develops this at a very early stage, and that is one of the mm. keys of why something by the middle of the 18th century in Britain seems to be going a different way. Mm. It may be symptomatic of the differences between uh, a highly innovative society like Britain, the time we're talking about, and some others. Uh, if I throw in the, the sad words in the preface to a book by a, a man in China called Song Yingxing in the early 17th century, when he writes a book on the technology of his time, he reviews mm. all the useful arts in a book called The Exploitation of the Works of Nature, Tian Gong Kai Wu. And uh, in the preface, he laments, look, I'd really like to have made this a better book. I'd like to have got some people together to talk about <laughs> the things in this, but I've got no funds, and so I've had to do all this myself. And as for you, sir, uh, who might be picking up this book in a bookshop, you'll probably want to cast this aside without reading it, because it certainly won't help you advance in the imperial civil service at all, so forget about it. <laughs> <laughs> Which gives an indication, I think, of the different motivations he expected from people in his society when it came to thinking about technical utility and innovation. Yeah. But, but I... I did but Diderot's encyclopedia yeah. did precisely this. It gathered together the useful arts. It set out how they, they he found yes. people, the, uh, Diderot and D'Alembert, they found people to describe the technologies. They had pl amazing plates made to, to, set, to actually mm. show how, how these machines were made and how the processes were carried out. Um, there, was, there were many fine dictionaries and encyclopedias produced in Britain during the 18th century. Mm -hmm. Most of them were just drawing a lot of their descriptions out of the encyclopedia. Mm. But do you think that well, having encyclopedias helped anybody invent anything? I think, <laughs> Simon, that you could, you could probably not say, I am going to invent uh, a better printing press. Let's open the encyclopedia under yes. printing. <laughs> <laughs> but I also think that Part of technological success, part of figuring mm -hmm. out um, that something might work better is, uh, particularly if you're new, if you're approaching a subject with a mm. fresh mind, to realize what can actually be done, mm, what sure. is being done. Yeah. And uh, I don't think that anybody could actually, uh, uh, say, set up a pin factory. You know, there's a wonderful uh, uh, set of mm. images in the encyclopedia yeah. about the pin factory, which reputedly inspired Adam Smith mm -hmm. to the famous first chapter in his Wealth of Nations. Now, I don't think that, I, that, that anybody could, if who knew nothing about pin making, uh, could look at that mm. entry and say, not wow, I know everything there's mm. to know about pin making. Let's open a pin factory. But suppose you already knew something about pin making, okay? Then looking at those pictures might give you a little bit of a better idea. You know, just to reorganize your shop, divide the labor a little bit better, experiment. That's how the French are doing. Maybe we can we can try it that way as well. Remember that a lot of new knowledge uh, uh, applied to production consists of what we would call recombination. Mm. Okay, take two pieces of knowledge from very different spheres mm. and put them together in a novel way. Now, how would you have access to this? Well, the first place you'd look at uh, is something like an encyclopedia or an engineering textbook, and which is the sort of internet equivalent of the 18th century. It, it puts together a, uh, sort of a, a, a the body of technical knowledge in an organized form. And one of the great advantages that Europe has and that China does not have is that something called alphabetization. Mm. The uh, encyclopedia and dictionaries and so on can be organized in a sense that when you know that you're looking for something, you know where to find it. Sure. Mm. And um, that kind of organization uh, means that the access to what is known uh, is made much easier. No, I see all that, but I mean, I would want to go back to something that Maxine said earlier, which is mm. that where the new devices or really apparently subtly new devices, so minor changes mm -hmm. turn out to have yeah. huge differences in productivity, returns to investment, capital mm. and so on. Mm -hmm. where, the, where, where those are coming from, I think I would want to argue, have something but not that much to do with what is written. And it's a big problem 
for us look, looking back to the 18th century that we so often have to rely on writing on what yes. is printed. I mean, okay. my impression, just thinking about the sciences on their own, is that most of what matters is going to be achieved by the transmission of people. Yes, because I mean, the, people carry people. skills around, and that takes us yes, back to the, to the importance of, of association. Having groups of people yes. working together in the same place and also having freedom of movement in relatively standardized national markets yes. is the key. No, you're absolutely right. And all the same, I would, for instance, point out that one of the greatest engineers of the time, John Smeaton, sure. insisted to teach himself French because he wanted to read articles written by the French, great French hydraulic engineers of his time. Oh, absolutely. Uh, and so, uh, now that is not a substitute for going to a site and actually looking at how these things work, okay? But particularly in, in, in things like hydraulic engineering, uh, where there's already a fairly high level of sophistication mm -hmm. in terms of the use of mathematics and so on, uh, there clearly a great amount of information is transmitted in writing. There are other uh, uh, industries, particularly, I think, in, in things like pottery and other chemi chemistry-related industry, where the knowledge is still basically uncodified mm -hmm. because the underlying scientific basis doesn't exist. Yeah, I mean, I'd certainly want to distinguish between, but, but also con connect, diffusing printed information, which is one thing, it's very important, it's certainly not the whole story, and working on paper. The big deal with, with the great civil engineers in England around Smeaton is that they learn better and better ways of working on paper. For example, they have better drawing instruments, they have better ways of transferring measurements from paper schemes to real-world systems, they have better ways of taking real-world systems and experimenting with them on paper, and that's what in English, a civil engineer means in the end. It, yes. it, it means someone who can move relatively frictionlessly between the drawing office and the workshop and the site. Colebrookdale is a magnificent example of this because it's a place where drawing offices and model building shops and real world working systems are all being built together. So I, I think there's this kind of overlap between, but there's also a distinction between the kind of things we're, we're talking about when we're talking about the big encyclopedias, which I really think are like a natural history of industry. They're a way of bringing in more sections of society into industrial enterprise and thinking about industry as this display of useful and perhaps profitable knowledge, as, a, as opposed to what happens in drawing offices, which is hard technical and in the end very really relevant work. Yeah, Tell me, Maxine, um, <laughs> you, went to, you went to Wedgwood's factory and um, were impressed by obviously the, the goods there and the marketing system. Um, what conclusions do you draw from what you saw? Well, even more important, I went to one of the places he sold his goods to, which was an amazing, um, well, it wasn't really a castle, it was a sort of prince's house designed on the model of um, an English country house with a landscape garden and everything. And this was the, the home of um, Franz Forst of um, Dessau, one of the German principalities. And this prince has the largest Wedgwood collection outside of Britain. Uh, now, the, the means by which he acquired this are very interesting because he was the victim of one of Wedgwood's wonderful um, package schemes where he decided, I am not just going to sell to, I, I need to sell to the aristocrats to show everybody I can produce the beautiful stuff and it's very desirable, but I also want to sell to the world. Um, and so he wanted, he, he took his, his creamware and his, uh, his fine earthenware, his black basaltware, his vases, and he packaged them up um, and sent his packages out to the, Ger out to the German states, um, inundated them with his, his goods, um, got some money back for them, but the point was that they became uh, uh, almost uh, a gallery of, new, of the new Britain's new consumer goods on show. In, um, in Germany and 
a, a place like Dessau, it wasn't just the friends of the family that visited the house. The a whole, it, the house was open for um, visitors from amongst the middle classes and the upper classes who trailed through this house and saw this stuff in situ and how it should be displayed, etc. And they too wanted to live the civilized life and, and have these things. And so he creates his market this way. Um, so I think there's one of the factors that's really important in, in this story is just how the market is made for, um, for new, new products. Uh, the British became really good at making wonderful modern imitations of European and Oriental luxuries. They said, we're importing this stuff at very high prices, we can produce them just as well, we can produce modern versions of them with new technologies, using um, machines, using cheap uh, metals and gilding them over or whatever, um, using alloys of uh, various alloys of metals and other chemical combinations, using coal instead of wood in, in the processing and still produce stuff that looks fantastic. Uh, but the point is, we had to, you know, we also, they, they also realized they had to sell the stuff. Um, so great efforts went into the marketing, uh, thinking about marketing and creating fashions, the new fashion goods. And so this whole concept of style and fashion and um, virtually creating a designer label. Um, starts in the 18th century. Wedgwood does this. A number of the other um, producers, uh, ceramics producers, um, also do the same. And um, this becomes the sort of new model of how to get um, get your goods sold. And so he was be both um, both he he and Matthew Bolton both agreed. Um, they didn't want to just produce for the kings and aristocrats, but to produce for the world. We've met this story somewhere else, haven't we? This is, this is what's called import substitution, isn't it? Where a country decides that it isn't going to spend a lot of money on buying things from somewhere else, it creates its own version of it, then through good marketing it turns into an export, and actually, of course, we have seen um, other countries do that in this century. Mm -hmm. If you look at Japan, for yes. instance, the yeah. story you've told, Absolutely. putting other goods in the place mm -hmm. of Wedgwood's products, mm -hmm. would actually have suited Japan very well indeed. So this is a strategy that countries that perceive themselves at first to be almost economically marginal in the world yes. context, move themselves to the centre of the world market. Yes. Britain succeeded in doing that. Yeah. The best example perhaps of all of this is the cotton industry which yes. becomes the pivotal industry of the Industrial Revolution mm -hmm. and the uh, cotton industry is originally set up as an import substitution mm -hmm. industry yeah. but you know it's not just marketing it should be said that it's not just the market that they improve mm -hmm. the marketing they make the product better by 1820 mm -hmm. the British can make cotton yarn and cotton cloth mm. better than anybody else in the And that's how late that is, isn't of it? Of course, because it takes them half a century of figuring out the technical problems mm. and actually, but cotton in some ways fits very nicely with Maxine's yes. idea of substituting yeah. for more yeah. expensive materials yeah. like fustians mm. and, and, and... But here the Europeans were doing mm. the import substitution game on the Indians, yes. whereas in porcelain they were doing it on the Chinese. Exactly. Yes. The, but the Indians were incredibly successful with how they, the enormous variety of ranges of cotton materials they could produce, and very cheaply. Um, I mean, the real, the, there was a real marketing problem there too, because the British had to convince their consumers to buy this stuff. Mm. And uh, until they, and, and to find a strategy of who to sell it to, they could bring the, stuff, the, the goods in very cheaply. Um, but they discovered the way to do it was not to try to sell it to the masses initially, but to produce, mm. to bring in fine cotton goods, which they would sell to the, to the middle classes and the gentry. Fine cotton goods, dyed in beautiful material, beautiful colors. And sure, the, uh, but if the price goes down low yes. enough because you're getting good enough yes. at producing it, then in fact even high quality stuff becomes affordable for the Absolutely. working class and certainly and that's what, that's what the, in, mm -hmm. in some sense mm -hmm. uh, uh, the industrial revolution did not succeed by selling uh, 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 shoddy substitutes for, for, yes. for, for, for import in fact the products that they were selling certainly by the beginning of the 19th century were very high quality in fact the kind of yarn that you could spin
mm. you know, with an, with an archive throstle, uh, produced a, a cloth that was of very high quality. Yes. And, uh, and so in some sense the Industrial Revolution did both. They allowed you to produce goods that were of high quality and very cheaply so that you didn't really have to cater to the middle class. And if the goods are good enough and cheap enough, in some ways they'll sell themselves and yes. you don't need elaborate marketing strategies to send them to the mass, to sell them to the mass. One of the things that's interesting about that is that you see the way in which import substitution is a really good explanation not only of the way in which the British economic system manages this very successful um, mm -hmm. imi imitation and then export at the level of what we might call processes mm -hmm. like making yeah. Yeah. certain kinds of pottery or making certain kinds of cotton but actually and I think, above all, gaining control of the primary commodities themselves. That is to say, you can't tell this story up to 1800, 1830 without thinking about what we now call biodiversity, because after all, what's happening in the second half of the 18th and the first half of the 19th century is that through economic botany, the British are gradually controlling the circulation and even the production of the primary goods, the tea, the cotton, the sugar, and so on. I mean, the Chris indigo, and one the, can extend I mean, all that list. The cobalt blue, right. I mean, all these pros. Uh, they, there was really this sort of perception. I mean, it's really uh, this a uh, quite. It seems odd to us now, but you look back. This perception of these territories around the world, which are seen as part of Britain. Yeah. That you could trying to to get to cultivate indigo. Um, in the Caribbean to find sources of cobalt in um, cobalt blue in right. other other parts of the British territories. It was seen as part of Britain so right. that they wouldn't have to import it from mm -hmm. Europe. No, but when they have to import they will because cotton after yes. all that did that does come from a country that sort of happened to become independent yes. right in the middle of yes. the Industrial Revolution. Yes. And for instance, <laughs> high quality iron ores were being mm. brought in from yes. Sweden and yes. Spain, these of which, yes. as far as I can Absolutely. recall, were part of the British yes. Empire at that time. Yes. Yes. So they get the stuff where they where they yes. can. If it's if yes. they can control it politically, all the better. Yes. But it is not an absolutely necessary condition. No, no. Yes. Yes. you're but, right about that. Well, but I think one needs to concentrate here on how it is that the British or how it is that the British system controls not only, say, Bengal and uh, large sections of the West Indies and so on, but how it is they control the sea lanes that link them even to plantations, as they would say, which, mm -hmm. which are not under the direct control of the British Crown. And that means sort of pulling focus a bit and not just concentrating on Lancashire and the Midlands and the Lowlands of Scotland, but or even Western Europe, but actually pulling back to British maritime control over a vast section of merchant trade, first of all in the, in the whole of the Atlantic economy, and then in the Indian and, and Pacific economies too. I mean, and this is what so many of those 18th century yeah. wars were about. Yeah. It was sure. blue given water all, policy. Given all this then, how does it come about that somebody like Adam Smith in the later part of the 18th century is labouring to convince people that colonies are not a source of profit? Well, because he has spectacular examples in front of him <laughs> of the wrong way to, to run mm. overseas territory. And obviously mm. what a canny Glasgow professor will first think of um, given that his best friends are tobacco merchants in, <laughs> in Glasgow, is the catastrophe of the Spanish Empire. Yes. I mean, yeah. That's the yeah. example which he trots out in his book in 1776. Yeah. And what he's arguing about, and it stays an argument in British thinking, both in the lowlands of Scotland and also in Whitehall in the colonial office, is the problem of areas like India. Mm. I mean, how is the East India Company Mm. going to survive? What is its economic as opposed to mm. political function? Should Britain be a land-based Asian military and economic power? Mm. Should it stay on the coast? Should, should it emulate to a certain extent the Portuguese and Dutch? Mm. Um, should it maintain a blue water policy with a vast navy but very little um, landed co yeah. colonial control, the the catastrophe of 1783 and the independence of the United States is also a, apparent to the generation yeah. after Smith. There isn't, I think, yeah. any kind of yeah. consensus about that, but what 
the political economists of Scotland are very aware of is, is that it's possible to have extraordinarily wealthy colonies, yes. prima facie, and be bankrupt. Yes, because yes. so that the problem is that what the Spanish colonies produced was simply money in the form of silver coming out of the ground, which you then spent yes. on being rich as long as it lasted, mm -hmm. as opposed to an ideal colony for Smith, which would be something that enabled you to have a nice trading relationship sure. with somebody who was producing sure. something you could produce yes. much better, sure. much better than you could yourself. Yes. With whom we had a free relationship. But, but the other thing that Smith is objecting to, and one can hardly fault him for that, is that it is possible for colonies to be unprofitable and still be beneficial uh, mm. for the process of industrialization. And what and, and the way that could be is that uh, colonies are very expensive because they require an army and a navy to yes. maintain them. And what you're really looking at indirectly is the British taxpayer, that is to say, mostly the poor and the working class subsidizing the industrialization yes. process through their taxes which yes. are then used to build ships and armies yes. that protect the colonies yes. and I think Smith would probably object to that and so might, yes, might yes, others yes, yes, yes. but in fact this does not preclude the possibility that this is a mechanism by which Britain sort of pulled itself up by mm. the bootstraps and, mm. and, 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 mm. and protected mm. Mm. its, uh, mm. its uh, colonial supply lines uh, when these came under fire, which happened uh, 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 regularly during the during the decade of the industry. Of course, one thing I know that uh, Alan says quite strongly ab uh, about the advantages of the situation of England, of Britain on an island, is that it does not need, like the great powers on the continent, to maintain a large standing army just to maintain its national integrity. By having colonies in North America, of course, Britain puts itself in the continental position and starts having that sort of military expenditure, uh, which uh, it normally would not have. No, no, and that's, that's quite true also. It, it, it should be borne in mind that the sort of heyday of the Industrial Revolution coincide with what's known as in Britain as the French and Napoleonic Wars, which cost Britain an enormous amount of money, even though there was no direct fighting on British soil, but the British national debt went to you know, multiplied by a factor of something mm. like a hundred mm. uh, uh, during mm. during these wars. And we've had income tax ever since. And no, no, not quite. It was it was immediately abolished <laughs> after the war and then, and, then, and then brought back in 1856. <laughs> never mind that. Uh, but the, ta the taxation level during yeah. these wars were extremely mm. high, and clearly these wars turned out to be very expensive. And one could argue that. Uh, those levels of taxation actually slowed down the industrialization process much uh, and, and it was much slower than it would have otherwise have been. But if you're looking at Britain compared to the European continent, where not only they had to pay taxes, but they also had fighting mm. on their soil, mm. and uh, uh, then probably increased the gap even so it slowed both of them down. But mm. you, I mean, couldn't, yeah. couldn't you also turn the argument around and say the, the capacity of, as we keep on saying, this rain swept? Um, slightly isolated group of islands off the northwest coast of Europe to maintain fiscal survival from 1793 to 1815, even though it's paying enormous amounts, not, not only to keep its own navy afloat, but also to subsidize most of the European armies in the field against the French, shows you that you have already a relatively efficient national system of excise which is capable of gathering and knowing what it is gathering in tax at a, at a relatively high and level. And beyond that, a nation that not only is efficient in raising taxes without triggering a, a national rebellion, sure. but also a nation that is capable for, of borrowing enormous right. amounts of money right. from its own people, from financial institutions right. in, in other places, that can sustain that. And so right. some of the in, institutional structures that we see operating so well during the uh, French and Napoleonic War clearly also are uh, part of the foundation of which allows this country right. to prosper. So is it, is it wrong to say that, that, I mean, many of the things that we end up pointing to when we're trying to answer this part of the riddle depend on credit and trust. Absolutely. Hmm. The, yes. um, right from the start of our story we said, um, look, when Josiah Wedgwood wants to get someone who isn't working for him to make something r reliable, he knows who to trust, he knows who the creditworthy artisan is to whom he can give that 
risk responsibility. When you have very good information flow, that means you must have very good systems of assigning creditworthiness and trustworthiness to different sectors of the e economy. And now we're saying, look, the capacity of the whole United Kingdom to survive and, in large measure, at the top of society, prosper between the 1790s and the 1820s is because it has this extraordinarily robust credit and trust system. And when we listen to Alan tell us about clubability, associativeness, again, we're talking about a society in which mutual trust, at least w within small face-to-face -face groups, is very, very high. I will confide in you about my own problems and you will be able to come up with some kind of answer. So then I think the question becomes, why is this society, at least in certain parts of it, found a way of assigning creditworthiness and trustworthiness so effectively in comparison to some other societies? I think that the market plays a, lot, a big role in that. I mean, this is a highly urbanized, highly in integrated economy. One that throughout, you know, for most of the 18th century really had been um, highly, very integrated into, um, into the, the market. There was one shop to every 50 people in, during the 18th century. Now some of these may have been very small scale, but everybody, everybody was having a very, um, very, a very active relationship um, with uh, buying consumer goods and all kinds of exotic consumer goods, tea and being in, everybody sort of having access to their, their local tea shops, etc. But also a, an economy that not only has the capacity to bear this enormous debt burden and to bear all this taxation, but to also continue to buy the new consumer goods it was producing. So yeah. when later on Napoleon mm. abuses the English as a nation shop shop shopkeeper, he's pointing to one yes. factor in his own defeat. Yeah, right. But he in fact doesn't get the entire picture because yeah. I think Maxine is absolutely right about the markets, but we mm. should keep in mind that markets do not just pertain only to commodities that you buy in shops, they also pertain to labor, mm. yes. to capital, absolutely. and to land, yeah. that is to say what economists call the factors of production, and that as far as we can tell in Britain, these things are far more developed than they are in other countries, including, for instance, in Germany, where the labor market is still very restricted mm -hmm. by um, a whole bunch of laws that prevent the mobility of people across boundaries, which they, you have lots of in Germany at that time, mm -hmm. yeah. and, and, and people changing occupations and people even changing employers, whereas in Britain, mobility of, of labor within, within the island, although it wasn't actually as, as huge as it would be, for instance, in the United States today, but people are free to come and go as they please and change employers. Uh, the same is true, certainly capital markets are beginning to show up in Britain, particularly for short-term capital Dis country Dis banks. Despite the laws against the export of artisans Dis and yes, machinery. Yes, yes. The oh. very fact that those laws <laughs> exist suggests yes, that we're yes, noticing exactly. it happening and what is it? There are lot, lots of laws in Britain that, <laughs> that were ignored. Uh, prohibit <laughs> what's actually going on. Yeah, that's all it. Right back, to the, right back to the seventh commandment, which yes. is a proof that the ancient Hebrews must have committed a lot of adultery. <laughs> I think that. that I would deny that. <laughs> <laughs> on this um, erudite point, I think perhaps we ought to um, sum up a little bit. It looks as if there are a whole set of conjunctures, factors. There are natural resource endowments which are helpful in Britain. There are um, certain forms of social, uh, social association which seem to be helpful. Uh, there's freedom of labor and so on. There's a, a reasonable craft tradition. But using uh, Simon's metaphor of drawing back, obviously we're not going to get any further in actually finding out why Britain at that time why not these other countries, unless we look more widely, because mm -hmm. what has come up several times is shipping. I mean, mm -hmm. all this could have been halted, if possibly, in some way, if Napoleon had won. Um, and one of the reasons he didn't win uh, was obviously the, the British Navy um, and, it, and Britain's wealth. So shipping played an important part there. The control that we've heard about of of the primary markets is important, the export of cotton and the import of cotton. You couldn't have had a, a cotton revolution without the shipping that had developed. But why had it developed particularly in Britain? And why Britain and Northwest Europe 
a lot of what we've heard shows that there is really a tiny infinitesimal gap between France, Holland, Germany, England, Scotland, and so on at this time. It's just very, very, very small. Um, Britain just had an edge. But this whole area seems to be, in many ways, very active. And in order to understand why that area and why shipping was so important, I think we need to draw back to a longer period and a wider area to try and solve this mystery. So let's do that.